I don't have to defend the Bible. I just got to get you hungry enough to do some basic homework to kind of look at what we believe. Is what we believe accurate or not? If it's accurate, then follow it. If it's not, come against it. Normally, I'd tell you to open your Bibles to the book of Matthew, and we'll start that next time, but I still got one more week of introduction. And uh, hopefully, if you don't get me sidetracked, we'll get through some of the introductory stuff that we actually want to talk about. And then we'll get uh, verse by verse through the book of Matthew. It's going to be fun. It's going to be fun. Let's pray. Father, we really, really love you. You're so faithful to us, Lord. Lord, we seek you. We look to you. So Lord, just guide our time. Help us, Lord, to bring clarity to the things that we're learning as we learn together. We love you a lot. We trust in you. Thank you, Jesus. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. This is a little heavier than normal as we look at some introduction. Normally we just jump right in to the Gospel of Matthew, which is our next book that we'll study verse by verse, line by line, and you'll know the book by the time we get done. But before we do that, there were some preliminary things we wanted to talk about, and they're a little heavier. Somebody said, you're missing an opportunity. This is really a Bible college course that you're doing here. And I said, no, I think you guys are sharp enough to be able to pick up on this. And a lot of the stuff you come here for very long, you'll learn as we go. Because we really do learn it is all about Jesus. As we go down this road, it really is all about, from Genesis to Revelation, we find him and it's all about Jesus. Not about religion. It's not about, you know, trying to do a systems of do's and don'ts. It's really all about Jesus. If it wasn't about Jesus, I don't know that I'd have made it. If it wasn't about Jesus, I don't like most of you people. You know, that's not true. I love you, your family. But, but over the years, you know, Christians are hard sometimes, hard to deal with. And it's easy to get our eyes off of God and off of Jesus and onto one another. But here's the thing is when we get our eyes on Jesus, we see each other differently. When we say it's all about Jesus, you don't want to just fly past that because it really is all about Jesus. He really teaches us how to love one another. He gives us understanding to his word as we study his word and the deeper things as we're, as we're looking at some of these, because this book is, is truly divine. In fact, as we saw last time and talking about it, there's really uh, prophecy after prophecy in this book. And if the prophecies fail, then we're going to do away with this book. But the prophecies don't fail. And we get to the gospel of Matthew, you're going to see over and over again, you know, it's going to be, it's going to be 50 times He's going to directly say, this is the scripture, this is the Old Testament promise and prophecy, and this is how Jesus fulfilled it. Over 50 times he's going to do that. We're going to see it over and over again, the prophecies fulfilled, because that's what Matthew is doing. He's trying to show Jesus is Messiah. It's going to be about 130 times he's going to allude to the Old Testament in this short book. And so he's going to really hone it in on this. We also talked last time about Uh, about God is not bound by time. Remember that? Helps us understand prophecy, understand this life that we're in. And we spent time there understanding that, that God, I can trust you. You're not bound by time. You see the future. I don't, you know, you see the future. And um, and so we talked about that. You can go online if you weren't here. Listen to that. We also talked about, we also about archeology span and geography as we get into the gospel of Matthew. I can't help myself we are going to talk about geography and we're going to talk about archaeology because it, you, set, you set the stories in the geography of where it takes place and it makes a lot more sense. It comes alive. When Jesus said, who do men say that I am? You know, you are the Christ. You're the son of the living God, Peter said. Where did he say that at? Caesarea Philippi. What was that about? What was the backdrop of that saying? It makes that passage come alive. And on and on it goes as we'll look at these geographical places. We'll look at the archaeology of that. And so again, we've already went through this. This was all just to to remind ourselves last time. And then we talked about the manuscripts. Remember the importance to understand is what we have accurate. You know, 25,000, over 25,000 uh, New Testament manuscripts that we have. Why is that important and how does that work? And we talked about that. And so you remember that? How many, how many, let me just do this. How many was not here last week? Was not here last week. Look at you guys. Where were you? Man, it was anointed. It was powerful. You missed some great things. The kind of glory of God came down and filled the place. And there were signs and wonders and you missed all that. Go online because this was all, we covered a lot last week. We really hit, we don't normally go this intense on things, 
But I think it's basics that we need to learn as Christians. And so we talked about the manuscripts, how do we trust this Bible, all those things that we as Christians, listen, we as we Christians, we ought to know what we believe and why we believe it. Why this book? And we talked about it last time, why this book? Why not other books that are out there? Why not the Quran or some of these others that are out there? Then we got, then we, this is where we left off right here. We start talking about, we talked about 66 books by 40 different authors, you know, over thousands of year period. And we have three continents, three different languages, the 66 books in your Bible. But what happens when you get a Catholic Bible, you get a Dewey translation, or you get another, or the original King James 1611, it has the Apocrypha. There's additional books there. Should we ignore those? Now, we're going to show you the difference between the Apocrypha and the lost books of the Bible. They were not lost. They were thrown out. They were not lost, and we'll talk about that. But the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha is good for history. It'll it'll fill in the gap between Malachi and Matthew in our Bibles. But they're not necessarily good. They're good for history, but not necessarily good for doctrine. I'm going to encourage you to just read them, you know. Read the Bible first. Have you read the entire Bible from cover to cover? Start there. Okay, 80 hours is all it takes. I start doing this. You know, it only takes me about four days because I'm, I'm real busy doing other things where I can listen to an audio Bible. And it takes me, it takes me about three to four days to listen to the entire uh, New Testament. And I'm just, I'm just finishing it up again. And it's been, this is like day three of that. And just because it's going, if I'm in my car, I'm listening to it. If I'm doing something that I don't have to think, I'm not, I'm not writing emails or doing something I have to think, I'm listening to it. And you'd be surprised at how much time you really do have. You know, the audio Bible, what a blessing. So start there, make sure you know what the Bible's all about, Genesis to Revelation, and know the Bible. And then it would not hurt you to do a little deeper research. Okay? It's not gonna, you're not going to go to hell by reading, reading the Apocrypha. You may learn a few things. Let me tell you some of the stories here in the Apocrypha, just so these are those books that, again, if you get a Catholic book, a uh, Catholic Bible, they're going to have them in there, and some translations will have them in there. Again, it's going to fill the gap between Malachi and Matthew. You're going to learn about what is Hanukkah, the Maccabean Revolt. What is that all about? Did Jesus, I think, I, I think this was your homework assignment last week, did Jesus... Um, did he go to Jerusalem and celebrate Hanukkah? Do you know what Hanukkah is? The answer is yes, he did. And yes, you ought to know what it's about. Basics. All right. So I won't get on this. This is another story for another time. I'm going to get to this. This one is fun. Bell and the dragon. I love this, you know, for you that love dragons and, and, uh, what was that? What was that? That, what was that was just on recently that had a dragon in it? Game of Thrones, right? Did you, how many people watch Game of Thrones? Be honest. Oh, you're going straight to hell. <laughs> Shame. <laughs> Look at. <laughs> I did not watch them all. All right. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't watch it. No, I watched a few of the first ones and said, nah, nah. But uh, here's the thing, though. Okay, let me, so let me tell you this. So this is in the Apocrypha. It's actually a pretty good story. Uh, it is. It is chapters of the book of Daniel that should have been added. Now, here's the problem with this is they're not in the style of Daniel. They're not in the time period. They don't fit any way, uh, shape, or form should it be in the Bible. Look at Daniel, they're, but they're fun stories. They're fun stories. Maybe they're legends or that, but there is a story. There's a couple. There's a, in the Bell of the Dragon story, there is a temple that has a idol of Bell. Okay, Baal. Okay, they'll go in there and they worship this idol. Well, they'll go in there at night, they'll put food on this table, food on the table, they'll close and lock the door of the temple, and they'll go in the morning and the food will be gone. And so, so they're all worshiping this idol, and Daniel starts laughing at him and saying, no, no, that's not what's going on. And the king says, all right, Daniel, here's what we'll do. There's 70 priests of Baal, they're, they're in, in charge of this temple. Now, here's what we'll do. It, you show us where they're wrong and where there is no, this is not real. And then we'll execute the 70, okay, brutal times. Or if we can, if they can prove it, then we'll execute you, Daniel. Are you willing to take that on? He goes, absolutely. And so what he does, he gets towards the evening where they're getting ready to lock the doors. He brings just the king with him and he takes a bucket of ashes and he takes those ashes and he puts them all over the floor. 
Now they shut the door and they lock it and put a seal on it. In the morning as they go in there and they open the door, the king looks in and he sees the table with the food all gone and he begins to worship. Oh, look, Baal is our our God. Daniel, you're a dead man, you know. And Daniel just starts laughing. He says, no. He goes, let's take a good look. Look at the floor. Look at the feet print. And you see see where the families of the priests and the priests that were in there. And he goes, well, wait a minute. Let's go follow these. They go underneath the table and there's a door. He opens the door and there's there's an exit for them in the entrance area. And that's where the priests were getting in this locked room and taking that food. That was a bad day for those priests, right? That was bad for them. So the the king says, okay, Daniel, if this idol... Okay, is no idol, but what do you do with the cave next to the, that has the dragon in it? And there was a, they, they, this story, there's a dragon in this that they worship. Daniel says, well, let me go in this cave and I'll kill that dragon. I'll kill that dragon. I don't even need a sword. I'll kill that dragon. He says, okay, go in and kill the dragon. So he goes in, this is what it says, he goes in and he takes a big fur ball, takes hair takes this lard, makes this big fur ball and feeds it to the dragon. And the dragon, now this will actually, ha- this, that actually works. Uh, it would work on your neighbor's cat. All right, just saying, <laughs> take a fur bar. If they eat that fur ball, they can't digest it and it could kill them. All right, don't do that. That's bad. All right. Okay. And don't tell me if you did it. I'd feel really bad. All right. But it works. Okay. <laughs> so, so in this story, he kills the dragon, right? Should these be in the Bible? Whatever. You can have them in your Bible if you want. doesn't matter because they're not going to change anything except to say those are interesting stories. The problem is they don't fit in the style of writing. They don't fit in the time period. They, these, these books were, were much later in, in all of that. So those are not, I'm not, it's not that big a deal, the Apocrypha. You know, if you, the the 1611 King James Bible, when the King James Bible first came out, uh, they had the Apocrypha in it. You know, is it something, does it change anything that we believe? No. Does it change anything of the histories uh, that we believe of in the Bible? No, it doesn't. What does it do? What it does is gives us an understanding of what Hanukkah is all about. What those 400 silent years, they call them between Malachi and Matthew, what was going on there. All right. So those are not, they're, they're not the issue. Never have been the issue. The issue is the lost books of the Bible. Let me tell you this, the lost, book, the lost books of the Bible have never really been lost. They were never honored. They were never, they were thrown out in the early church for the ones that, none of them were really early church, by the way, anyways, they're several hundred years after the fact, but they were never, they were never copied on a regular basis. They were never honored. In fact, as you begin to see the ones that surface, it's in the 1800s and the 1900s that they actually uh, found them, all right? This one here, I talked to you a little bit about it last time, is the Gospel of Peter. Well, this should be in our Bible. Oh, should it? The Gospel of Peter, um, found in 1880 in the coffin of a monk that lived just before the Crusades in the 900s. All right, should we have this in our Bibles? Well, you just got to read it. You know, it was, remember this last time? I think I talked to you about this last time. It's, uh, it was called the Talking Cross Gospel. Do you remember that? How many remember that? Good, like, like 15 of you were actually paying attention. Yes. Yes. The talking. So what it was is in this, in this story, should this be in the Bible, in this story as they went in to the tomb to see the empty tomb where Jesus was laid out, there also was a cross in there. There also was a cross, the cross that he died upon. That cross began to talk to them and encourage them. He's resurrected. And as they left the tomb, the cross followed them and was talking to them. Okay, the talking cross. I think we missed something in our Bibles. You know, there's the talk. How about this one that was found in 1970? Um, and again, these, like the, the Gospel of Judas, was known about early on. Church fathers knew about this, but they, they refuted this a long time ago. This is actually pretty blasphemous. This makes Judas the hero of the story. Jesus is a major manipulator. It kind of flips the story all around. Actually, it really has uh, some lines in there about the, the God of the Old Testament is an evil God, right? So there's, so the early church, whatever, this is garbage. They had an agenda. 
A lot of these writings, they had an agenda, the Gnosti group, the secret knowledge group, they had an agenda and why they're floating these out of there. They're not from the early church, they're from later on. And yet there's so many like, uh, was it Down Brown and in um, in Da Vinci Code and all that saying, well, look, the Catholic church took these out because they had, they had, uh, tr- you know, truce in them. They didn't want to, f- that's all garbage. None of that's true. They threw them out because they, here's, here's the deal. They threw them out because they read them. They read them. They'll say, well, the gospel of Thomas absolutely should be in our Bible. And it's a shame that it's not there. It's not in your Bible. Have you, the only people that say that are people who don't read this stuff. Just read it. The God, let me just, re, I'm going to read a little bit of this one, just because this is the one that generally comes up. The Gospel of Thomas is 114 secret sayings of Jesus. The 114, boy, I want to know the secret sayings of Jesus. He might tell us something really cool in there. 114 secret sayings of Jesus. All right. Here's just a couple of them. And all of these are kind of are whacked. All right. Here's the seventh one, straight from the Gospel of Thomas. Jesus said, now listen to this, you got to really pay attention to this. This is secret, it's deep, it's powerful. Listen to this. Jesus said, lucky is the lion that the human will eat so that the lion becomes human. And foul is the human that the lion will eat and the lion still will become human. I think that's a proof verse right there that they smoked pot in that those days, all right? Because that actually makes sense if you smoked a couple of joints. You go, man, the, the lucky is the lion that the human will eat. It's going to become human because it comes part of you. Wow, that's deep, all right? That's weird. Now, if it was just that, you could say, well, maybe that's some kind of, it's kind of a mix up by the by the copyist or something like that. No, just keep reading through this. The Gospel of Thomas, the secret sayings of Jesus. This one, listen to this one. This was blasphemous. Uh, the 14th, and by the way, all these, you can read these online, all right? Uh, Jesus said to them, if you fast, you will bring sin upon yourself. And if you pray, uh, you will be condemned. And if you give charity, you will harm your spirit. That's, uh, that is in the face of what Jesus actually said. That's actually blasphemous, right? Oh, just uh, let's go to the grand finale one. The 114 secret sayings of Jesus. What's the 114th one? Here's the greatest one in the book. Listen to this. Simon Peter said to them, says, Simon Peter says, make Mary leave us for females don't deserve life. Jesus said, look, I will guide her to make her male so that she too may become a living spirit resembling you males. For every female who makes herself male will enter the kingdom of heaven. Wow. That was way before its time. (laughs) Wow. Wow, that's pretty radical right there. All you have to do is read the the lost books of the Bible. Now, I don't want to lump them all together because that's not fair and that's not helpful to us. Uh, because there is a grouping of, the, 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 these always get championed, uh, this group of documents that we have, these manuscripts that we have, they get championed as these are the ones that got thrown out. And when you read them, they're crazy. Uh, but understand this, that there is a lot of early church works that you ought to be at least a little bit familiar with, because you have Peter, Paul, Mary, and Peter, Paul, and Mary, and Get only old people laugh at that. Peter, Paul, and John, and others that, that have that have written, we have in our Bible. All right, we have in our Bible. Now they had they had students, they had disciples. Now Clement of Rome, Ignatius, and Polycarp. You've met because Polycarp, we've talked a lot about. He's a he's the pastor of Smyrna, and I've actually I've actually read some of his letters to you guys. All right, and some of these others. Now these were never considered by anyone to be part of the Bible. These, were, these are commentaries on the Bible. I think it's Clement of Rome that, that does a whole commentary on 1 Corinthians. And that's a whole, you know, he's just going through and, and highlighting some of the things. First. Polycarp does one in, um, I want to say it's like a, a Philippians or I think it's Philippians. He does one, look it up. But he does a commentary on, on one of the letters of Paul. And so you have these, these are letters. These are very interesting because they tell you about what they were thinking when they were reading these, uh, when they were reading the Bible. It tells us what they were thinking uh, about what was going on in their church. 
Um, you learn a lot about like Polycarp because he was, he was martyred. You'll learn a lot about that time period. To say you're a Christian is different today than it was then on that day. To say you're a Christian could absolutely mean your life. And you'd, you'd see these letters going around by secular people and by Christians and the secular people going, why are we killing these Christians? Why are we killing them? They're good people. And you have these long letters that are written and you see some of the responses to them. You know. But some of the early writings that we have, I mean, you have the Didache, the teaching of the Twelve, right? That, that is early on in the Christian church showing how they had church. That's very fascinating, how they did baptism, how they did communion, you know, how they did discipleship within their church. Now that's an early document of the church that's interesting. It's, it's got some good stuff for the church today. How about this one? Never was argued that this should be in the Bible, by the way, but the Apostles' Creed. Most of you have known this. Most of you have seen this. You come from a, a more formal church. Maybe uh, every, I know some of the churches in town, every Sunday they read this together. And I think it's not a bad idea. Okay, this is the earliest document we have of the church to say this is what we believe as a church. Okay, and then it moves from here to the Apostles' Creed to the Nicene Creed to some of the other creeds that, that took this as the backdrop and began to expand it because they had cults that were coming in teaching weird things. And so they were trying to, trying to refute that. But here are the early days of the church. What, what should we believe as a church? We should believe, of course, the Word of God, sure. Uh, but here's, here's, they put it in a nutshell. This is what we believe as Christians early on. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the creator of heaven and earth. And in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. I like older, some of the translations. He was conceived by the Holy Ghost. I just like saying it that way. The Holy Ghost. <laughs> feel more Pentecostal that way. The Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and buried. He descended into the grave. He descended into hell, as you'll read some of them say. But you don't want to misunderstand. He did not go to hell to be tortured. That's not what that's about. He is physically dead in the grave. Next line, on the third day he rose again from the dead. All right, so don't, some of these, some people would take, so show, look, Jesus went to hell. No, that's not the word. The word is Hades. The word is the grave. It's all about context of where you put that. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. He came again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> I believe in the Holy Spirit. I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. Ooh, stay tuned on that one. The communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and life everlasting. Amen. This was what they came together and said. Now, legend is that there's 12 lines of this. Legend is that there's, a, uh, there's 12 apostles. Each apostle did a specific line. None of that's true. All right? This is much, much later than that. But the, but the reality of it is in the early church, they were saying, look, we need to come together and say, this is what we believe. This is what they believe. This was, this was in distribution before the Roman Catholic Church. I believe in the Holy Catholic Church. I believe in the Catholic Church. All right? The word Catholic means universal. What we think about Catholic Church today, they've done exactly opposite, not to come against the Catholics. I'm not anti-Catholic. There's a lot of good things in Catholicism. There's a lot of good things in Protestantism. There's a lot of bad things in both of them. I'm all for Jesus, all right? But the thing is this, with the Catholic Church, if you go back, that word Catholic Church means universal. Okay? It, and they did exactly opposite of what that word is all about. They took that word, says it's our word, it's our group, and there is no salvation, true Catholic doctrine, there is no salvation outside of the mother church. There is no salvation outside of our group. That's scary right there. I'm going to say this, there absolutely is no salvation outside of Jesus Christ. All, all every knee will bow, and every time we'll confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Now, how he, how he interjects with people, how he reaches people, that's between, that's between them and God. But I do know this, it's not any, any group that says, look, if you don't attend our church and do our rituals of religion, then you're not going to heaven. That's a little scary right there. How about this? Love the Lord God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. Love each other. Everything else fits. Everything just seems to fall into place. Love God. Love God. Okay, that was, I'm glad he said that one first, because that's the easy one. Love God. 
and then love each other. You know, that's a little harder. I love God a lot. This one's a little harder sometimes. But hey, check this out though. When I got this relationship right between me and God, this relationship's a lot easier. So if I do that one first, love the Lord to God with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, I'll love the things that God loves. And you know what he loves? He loves people. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. God loves people. Lord help us in that. So when it says Holy Catholic Church, I actually had some people really upset that this is in our, if you go to our website, this is what we believe here at Calvary Chapel Salt Lake, you'll see this. If you come to our Calvary 101 class, I'll take you through this, right? I've done whole Sunday mornings where we've we've gone line by line through this. Okay, well then you believe in the Holy Catholic Church. Yes, I do. I believe in the universal church. And there'll be some Catholics there. There'll be some Protestants there. There'll be some Pentecostals there. There'll be some Pentecostals in heaven if they don't run past it. All right? Okay. (laughs) All right. We'll all be. Okay, so you have this. So back to this now. You guys doing okay with this? You guys, this is heavy stuff. But listen, as Christians, let's know what we believe and why we believe it. Let's don't just don't do the warm fuzzies. There's time for warm fuzzies as we, we go through the Word of God. But this stuff's important. Why do we believe that this is the book that we should be reading? Why do we believe that these 66 books, why, why do we believe that? What about these other books? And again, you have those, that, the, the apostles, you have the writings in the Word of God, and then you have the others that are writing commentaries. They're not, they're, it's, not, it, it's, it, it's not the Bible, but they're good commentaries on the Bible. Some of them, I think was... Um, I think Clements is like really super long. I dare you to try to read it without falling asleep. All right. Not saying anything. I'm going to meet him one day. You know, hey, I liked your stuff. It helped me, helped me sleep good. All right. So, so you have that. So let me, let me get past this. All right. Because you have, we could really spend hours and hours looking at this, but I am so running out of time. I hate that clock. That clock is the demon. All right. So, but let's get to this. Let me at least get, lay a foundation for what we need to talk about. Uh, next time is this. Why all the different versions of the Bible? Why do we have the ESV and New American Standard and the Living Bible and all of that? In order to get to that, I'll do this really quickly. Again, we need another 20 hours on this. Let's start with this. Is it how we got, we got to talk about the English Bible because that's what we're reading. Is that the English Bible? You know, there's 1,617 New Testaments outside of the English Bible. The, the arguments that we have, well, I'm King James only. That only flies in, in English-speaking areas. It doesn't fly in Germany or France. or They don't care about your King James Bible. They're reading it in their own, their own language. But let's stay on the, on the English language. On the English language, you have the original, the original manuscripts. Okay, you have the copies. You get, to the, you get to the Latin Vulgate. By the way, all of this is on these walls over here that tell you the story of this thing. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time right here. But you get to the, the Latin Vulgate. Well, at, at one point, even the priest didn't read Latin anymore, right? They didn't understand Latin. And so you have Wycliffe, Tyndale. These are heroes of, my heroes of the faith. Wycliffe, he came along and said, okay, we need to translate this Latin and these manuscripts that we have into the English language. Now, you'll see a copy of what he was doing on the wall over there, okay? Super rare uh, Bible page. It's probably like, right. I think it's that one right there. So, so Wycliffe, I liked him a lot because here's, here's, what, here's where it gets really kind of sideways in this story, is right here is where they were translating the Bible in the English language and getting out to people. Right here is where all the wars took place within within the Christians and the Protestants and all the, you know, the Protestants, the pro, we protested the Catholic Church. That's with Martin Luther, the same time period right here. What caused that? People started reading the Bible in their own language and going, wait a minute, I'm being lied to, right? Now, again, not to come to the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church is not the villain in this. People are because the, because the Catholic Church were burning people at the stake for reading the Bible in the vulgar tongue, in the English language. But the Protestants were burning Catholics and they're burning churches and they were killing priests, all right? Everybody was killing each other in this time period, all right? And so it's an it's a ugly, ugly time. If you want to be honest about this time, it's pretty ugly because when people read the Bible, they said, wait a minute, I've been lied to. I will never be lied to again, all right? And so Wycliffe began to translate the Bible into the English language. 
begin to get it out. Little, I mean, this is all handwritten before the Gutenberg press. And so they're the little pages because you had to hide them, right? If you get caught with one of these, it's a death sentence, right? Um, I like this guy because he ticked off, he ticked off the Catholic church so bad that the Pope said, burn him at the stake. They said, well, he can't, he's dead. Doesn't matter. Burn him at the stake. He's dead. Doesn't matter. Burn him at the stake. Dig him up and burn him. So they went to where his church is at, Lutterworth, England, went to his church, found his grave, dug him up and burned his bones years and years after he had died. And then dumped his dumped his, the ashes of those bones into, it's a, about a five, five minute walk out to, out to this little um, little creek. It's a little river, it's a river, a little creek that runs by there. They dumped it into this river, the River Swift it's called, the River Swift. It ran all the way out to the ocean. So the word was that, that, uh, that Wycliffe, he started off in this small church in Lutterworth, England, but he went out to the whole world. All right. And so, um, but then you have, then you have Tyndale, the next one there, Matt, because he was taking his work and, uh, and, tr- and, and finishing the translation and all that. Well, he was on the run. By the way, by the way, let me say this to you. There's a, there's a really good uh, couple films on Netflix. They do a good job on telling these guys story. They've done, done very, very well. I encourage you to watch them. All right. So, but Tyndale, eventually he gets betrayed by a friend of his, betrays him. Now they're, they're, they're going to burn him at the stake again for translating the Bible into the English language. They don't want people to have the word of God in the English language. Why? Because then you'll learn what we're saying is not true. It's in the vulgar language. If we tell people that, look, if you, your sin, you got to you know, pull your eye out, then we'll have a whole world of people that have pulled their eyes out. We need to tell them how to understand the word of God. You know, this is not true. Not true. They were a little merciful to Tyndale. They're going to burn him at the stake. They put him on, they put him on, a, on a big pile of wood. They have this stake behind him that he's leaning up against, has a hole in it, and has a rope through it. And that rope goes, goes, goes through this around his neck and back through and they put a piece of wood on it so when they can, they can winch it down and choke him to death. They're being merciful to him. They're going to choke him to death before they burn him. And as they're getting, as they're getting ready to choke him, he says, Lord, open the eyes of the king of England. Okay, that was his last words. Lord, open the eyes of the king of England. So they, they choke him to death. They burn him. And in the next, this next generation of Bibles that is there, it is, it is Bibles that the king says, the king says, I want a Bible translated in the English language in every church. And it was called the chain Bible. They had to chain it to the pulpit because people were stealing it, right? Because very valuable, right? So they had the chain Bible and they had these Bibles that, that were now, and that translation of that Bible in the last page of it has a big TW for, for, for our, our, our William Tyndale, WT. TW is, is his brother, or Ted. All right. So <laughs> never mind. I made that up. All right. So <laughs> I want to see how far I put you guys to sleep already. All right. So, all right. So that's more than you wanted to know. We need to do a smaller class of this where we can really dig in. Amen? Yeah. Well, no, no, maybe I'll do it. Okay. So we'll get to this. All right. What, what I need to, where I wanted to get you to today is to just get a, get a basic understanding of, of this, again, the English language Bibles that we have. You get up, you know, I didn't talk about the Geneva Bible, the Bible of the Pilgrims. Problem with the Geneva Bible, the translation's good, but the, the study notes, this is like one of the very first study Bibles. The study notes in there are pretty caustic against the Catholic Church. The introduction to the book of Revelation shows that the Pope is the Antichrist. Okay, the Catholic Church did not appreciate that at all. All right, so what they did is they came up with their own translation, the Dewey translation. The Dewey translation doesn't have any notes in it, and it's a good translation. They did well with the, here's the text that we're working from and in, into the English language. They did a good job with that. Then you have the King James and all, all the way up until we have all of our modern day translations. And that's where I want to start there, because why do we have the various translations? I'll talk about interlinear next time. But this is, this is where we want to land. Uh, this is actually where we want to start at next time. I want you to understand, and then we'll get past this, we'll get into the Gospel of Matthew. But why do we have the various translations? Okay, how are they translated? Interlinear, all the way to paraphrase. Okay, New American Standard Bible, all the way to the Message Bible. How does this work out? 
Christian, we ought to know this, right? Otherwise, here's what happens to us Christians. We don't know the basics about what we believe. We don't know the basics about why we're different translations. And someone comes along and says, well, you know, all these plain and precious truths have been taken out of the Word of God. You know, you can't, you can't trust the Bible because it's been mistranslated and all that. And we don't know how to answer that. And by the way, if that is true, then why are we studying the Bible? If that is true, let's don't do this. Let's do something else. But the more you study this thing, the more you'll realize, look, I don't need to defend the Word of God. I don't need to defend the Bible. I love what someone said in the past. The Bible is like a lion in a cage. I don't have to defend it. I just have to let it out. I don't have to defend the Bible. I just got to get you hungry enough to do some basic homework to kind of look at what we believe. Is what we believe accurate or not? If it's accurate, then follow it. If it's not, come against it. All right? You know what I mean? Do your homework. That's, that has been my life all the way through. I came at this Christianity thing uh, very, uh, very clear and concise with this idea. If it's true, I'll follow it. If it's not, I will, I will be a nightmare to you Christians. You know, it's, it's like you, you, were not, you were not in the picture yet. I didn't know if you're going to be my friends or if I'm going to take you out one by one. All right. Either way, I was coming at this thing because, because this is something the entire world is looking at. Well, let's take a look at it. And the more I studied the Word of God, the more I dug into it, the more I researched it, the more I fell in love with God's Word, understanding this is the Word of God. This is the Word of God. You know, now, how, how, can, we, how can we answer the questions? Just do, do some basic homework. Do some basic homework. So next time we'll start with this. How do, why do we have these different Bible versions, these translations and all that? We'll kind of get into all of that. And then we'll finally get... Let's see, we'll finally get to the Gospels, all right? And we'll, we'll pick on this guy right here, Matthew, all right? Probably that guy right there, but it might be that guy. <laughs> okay. That's a lot, huh? All right. But here's the thing, guys, we can, we can go through, and again, I'm going to say this to you because I want you to understand this, is that we can do the warm fuzzies in our church. We can go through the fun stories that we have in the Word of God, which we do. We'll learn these things and we'll see what happened in the Gospel of Matthew. But at the end of the day, let's know why we believe what we believe. Let's just don't do it because, because some pastor says that you need to believe this way. Let, you know, I used to say this a lot. I mean, I should come back to it. When you come to Calvary Chapel here, don't check your brains at the door, all right? You open your Bible. You see if this is accurate. You do what the Bereans did. You search the scriptures to see if these things are so. There is so much garbage out there today in churchianity. It's better just say, okay, let's, I'm going to, Lord gave you a brain. He gave you the Holy Spirit. He gave you everything you need to, 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 uh, for godliness and to know what the word of God. So, so do the basics, do the basics. All right. I'll help you with it. We'll do it together. You know, so good stuff. All right, that's all I have to say about that. All right, okay. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, we really, really, really love you. Lord, thank you for this family. Thank you for the things we're learning, Lord. And I pray that, Lord, that we'd absorb the things that are helpful to us, Lord. Lord, the weird things that this weirdo pastor says, Lord, those things that fall on deaf ears. But the true nuggets of truth, Lord, I pray would resonate in our hearts. Help us to hear your voice. Help us to believe in you and follow you, Jesus. And Lord, give us, give us an understanding of your word. As we dive into this brand new book study, Lord, I, I pray that we would know what we're reading. This is from you, God. This is your story, but this is from you. And we love you a lot. And thank you for this family, Lord. You didn't call us to be religious. You didn't call us to be Protestants, Lord. None of that stuff is, is what what you meant and what you died on the cross for. Lord, you died on that cross that we could be forgiven, that we could know that that's what love really looks like. He really does love us. If you're not sure where you're at with him, start right now. Maybe you need to come back to him. Start right now. This is between you and God. I can only point the way, but you've got to make this step. This is your journey. Jesus, forgive me of my sins. Help me to follow you. Give me understanding in your word. You pray this right now between you and God. Lord, give me understanding of your word. Lord, help me to follow you. 
You put it in your own words. He's here. We love you, Jesus. We love you a lot. Lord, we long for home. Someday we finally get to run into your arms. But until that day, Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for your Holy Spirit, Lord. Thank you for the things that we're learning. We love you a lot. We love you a lot. Thank you, Jesus. Let's all stand together.